So uh, this afternoon, we're going to turn back to your, to your booklet, to this third session. And um, I want to ask, first of all, before we move into this afternoon session, what were the two main points of this morning, one from each session? What were the headers or the verses that I said, if you don't take anything else away, take these two with you? What was the first one? Anybody remember? The river of God is full of water from Psalm 65 verse 9. Yeah, what was the second one? Wherever the river goes, there's life. Everything lives wherever the river goes. Two great promises from the Lord. Well, this third one that we're looking at this afternoon is just simply, there is a river. I love that, <laughs> just to know for certainty that there is a river, and it's a river of life, and it's flowing through hearts who trust in the Lord. That verse uh, comes from um, Psalm 46, but before we read that verse, I want to read a quote that I put. It was about uh, Charles Spurgeon. We quoted something from him just before lunch, but this was something that was written about him by a man called David Powelson. Um, and he says, The river of life often flows through sloughs of depression. Charles Spurgeon, Prince of Preachers, knew that well. He knew the God from whom life flows. But he knew the God where life comes from because he lived so much of his life in depression. In fact, I think I brought a book with me here, and it's called Surgeon Spurgeon's Sorrows. And uh, so I don't know if you knew that, but Sir Spurgeon suffered with depression all his life. He, as a 22-year-old preacher, a Baptist preacher in the UK, <clears throat> spoke it's a very large venue, huge venue, thousands of people in London. And as he was 20 year, 22 years old, and in the middle of the preaching, somebody shouted, fire. And it caused absolute chaos. And it was just some prankster. But as a result, seven people died, and over 20 or 30 people were very seriously injured. And it broke him, absolutely broke him. And the next time he got up to preach two weeks later in that same place, he was completely transparent with the people and he just talked about the depths of despair that he'd experienced. And he said, I don't even know if I can preach here today because the memories are flooding back, the horror of what happened. And he never recovered from that. It affected him. He continued to struggle with depression his whole life. Uh, some of it was spiritual, some of it was chemical. That incident had a huge impact on him. So he understood what it's like to have depression, to go through these dark times. And yet, in those dark times, look at the rich word revelation that God gave him. That one of the most powerful uh, daily devotionals, Spurgeon's Morning and Evening, which has got so much richness. When you think how old he was, he was a young man when he was writing these things. But he was so full of the life of God. And where did he find it? In his deepest, darkest hours, the river of God was flowing through his life. You see, we don't have to look all happy, clappy, and like, I've got a great life and everything's going well. That is not necessarily an evidence of the Holy Spirit flowing through your life. In fact, it's more likely that it's flowing through your life when you're going through your desperate trial and you're clinging on with one thread saying, God, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. Not everybody experiences a, a life which is problem-free, which is a false gospel. Jesus never promised us that. He said, I will be with you in the trials. He never said he was going to deliver us out of them. He prayed for that. He said, I'm not praying that they're taken out of this world. I'm praying that you will strengthen them in it. That means we need his spirit because Greg Laurie, did anybody see the movie, The Jesus Revolution? I'm sure a lot of you did. The song that we played at the beginning, that was from that movie. Fantastic mu movie on the reality of the Holy Spirit being poured out on a whole generation. Um, but Greg Laurie, um, I heard him saying, it's impossible to live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit. Absolutely impossible, and I believe that's true. 
We can try and manufacture what looks like a Christian life. We can do a lot of religious things and good works. But what God's looking at is what's going on in the heart. He said to the Pharisees, Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, it's like your lips are moving and they're saying all the right thing, but your hearts are dead. There's nothing in there that's bringing me any glory. When we go to Psalm 46, it says, God is our refuge and strength an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Now, this is the good part. When all that tumult is going on, with that roaring and seas are overwhelming and the mountains are falling apart, which is a very scary picture. And then this sentence comes, there is a river. In the midst of the noise, in the, no in the midst of the shaking, there is a river. Whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at the break of day. There is a river. I think there, there seems to be some evidence that this psalm was written during a period when Hezekiah was king in Jerusalem. And I think I said earlier this morning, Jerusalem was a unique city in ancient times in that it had no river in the city. Most cities were founded close to or built on the banks of rivers for obvious reasons. They needed water supplies, <clears throat> but that was not the case with Jerusalem. And so King Hezekiah um, was being attacked by the Assyrians. And some of you, if you've been to Israel, will know this history because you can actually see this. Um, he decided, the Assyrians thought that they were going to starve and thirst the people to death. They were going to cut off the outside water supplies so that they would have no food and they would have no, no drink. And eventually they would all die in the city. They would surround the city. They would all die inside. Hezekiah, being a wise king, he had a plan to dig tunnels outside the walls of the city from a spring called Gihon. And, he, and so he started building a tunnel underneath from one side going west. And from the other side, inside of Jerusalem, there's a pool called Siloam. You've heard of that. And they started digging east. And eventually, the two met up. And so the water was flowing from outside the city underground to the pool of Siloam, and then he covered it all over so the springs could not be seen. It was all hidden, hidden underneath. So it's like you get this picture here that the world was shaking, they're being attacked, but there in the center of Jerusalem, underground, hidden, there were tunnels. And Dennis, I think we have a couple of slides, if you could pull that up, that just shows perhaps helps us to see what that might look like. There's, you can see the river, that the, the tunnel rather, that started at the Gihon Spring on the right, um, and then it comes under the city, it's called Hezekiah's Tunnel, and it reaches all the way down to the Pool of Siloam. And today you can actually visit those tunnels and we can see the next photo. There we go. Um, they were big, secret places. And it just makes us think about, I think, that verse we read this morning when, it said, when Jesus said, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink, and out of his innermost being will gush forth torrents of living water. His innermost being. No matter what is happening in our outer life, our circumstances, our families, our finances, our health, <clears throat> the country, the everything, our relationships, whatever it is that's affecting us, that causes us to feel like we're going through storms. If I can remember, there is a river. And I need to call on that river. That's where I find peace. The most important thing is that I'm following him. Following him means I need to die to everything that's of me that I think with my human wisdom and say, Lord, I am trusting you to go where you lead me. And how do I know I'm going where he leads me? When I have peace. The peace that passes understanding because a fruit of the Spirit is peace. 
I don't have peace when I'm going in every direction. Now, does that mean it's easy when I'm in the situation? No. But there is a river. There is a river that flows through the city of God. And who is the city of God? Who is the new Jerusalem? We are. We are. And that's what I have to cling to. Lord, I have to let your peace that flows like a river through my soul every single moment. And it's a choice, <clears throat> excuse me, that I have to make. There's some great scriptures that speak to this. <clears throat> excuse me, where you see this contrast of the storms and the raging sea and then God just coming and quietening it. For example, Psalm 65 verse 7. You quieted the raging oceans with their pounding waves, <clears throat> and you silenced the shouting of the nations. Next one, Psalm 77. When the Red Sea saw you, O God, its waters looked up and trembled. The sea quaked to its very depths. The clouds poured down rain. The thunder rumbled in the sky. Your arrows of lightning flashed. Your thunder roared from the whirlwind. The lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your road led through the sea, your pathway through the mighty waters, a pathway no no one knew was there. The pathway of salvation that was there for God's people. He made a way, and it says, you led your people along that road like a flock of sheep with Moses and Aaron as their shepherds. God did the miracle. He did the powerful stuff, but he appointed men to lead them out. He led Moses and Aaron, who led the people. God's looking for leaders who will trust him and obey him. And he wants help to empower us to trust him for the miracles while we step into the water. When Joshua crossed the Jordan, the priests had to cross in first. And sometimes God's saying, you've got to cross in before anybody else can cross over. You've got to make a way. If you want to minister to other women or to your family, you've got to step in there by faith yourself and pray them across and nurture them across and encourage them across and exhort them across, but get them across the river into the abundant life. Get them over there, but you've got to stand in the water. You've got to be filled with the Spirit. Here's a great passage. Well, that psalm leads on to the Lord is my shepherd. He leads me by peaceful streams. That beautiful shepherd psalm. Psalm 42. Listen to this NLT, New Living Translation version. As the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for God, the living God. Where can I go and stand before him? Day and night, I only have tears for food, while my enemies continually taunt me, saying, where is this God of yours? I hear the tumult of the raging seas as your waves and surging tides sweep over me. But each day, the Lord pours his unfailing love upon me, and through each night, I sing his songs, praying to the God who gives me life. Have you had a season like that? where tears have been your food, where you're doing nothing but crying, or maybe people are mocking you and saying, where's God in all this? And you start questioning yourself, like, Lord, did I do something wrong? And he's saying, trust me. Trust me. Keep your roots in the river. I know what I'm doing. I will not leave you. And we can say, my heart and my flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart heart and my portion forever. Isaiah 43, 1 to 3. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by your name and your mind. Put your name in there. He says, I've called you by your name. You are mine. And Diana, Linda, Tracy, Claudia, Jesse, can't see all of you here, wherever you are. He's saying, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. I mean, he doesn't say you'll never have high waters. He says, when you pass through them, they won't drown you. They won't sweep you over you. Why? Because I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. 
This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. There's salvation right there. The chariots from Egypt were chasing after the children of Israel. They come, talk about between the devil and a hard place. There's the Red Sea in front of them. There's all these Egyptians, the pharaohs, the horsemen, everybody, their chariots, they're coming after them. And they're wedged in the middle of it. How are they going to get out of this one? And they start complaining, going, you brought us out of Egypt and here we are, we're stuck here, we're going to drown or we're going to be killed by the pharaoh. God makes a way. And he says, I will destroy your enemy. You know, some of us, it's like we get, we think we're out of Egypt, and then the past just starts coming after us. And you're like, I'm never going to get rid of this shame. I will never break free of my past. It's like it just keeps coming back to haunt me. But there comes a time. God says, no, I drowned it. I delivered you from that. And I dealt with Satan at the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 15, it says, all of our sin was nailed to the cross and Satan's power was taken away. He, he's shooting dead bullets. There is no power. Why? Because his power was drowned in the blood of Jesus. That's the river. There is a fountain filled with blood, flows from Emmanuel's side. And that's where we take our past. Sinners plunge beneath that flood, and he washes away all their guilty stains. The enemy cannot come after you when you're immersed in the river, in the river of God. And that's where we walk by faith. We have to trust in that. So we have this example of he drowned Pharaoh's armies. And then it goes on to say, forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. Look, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Don't you perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. I am going to send my spirit on dry ground. I'm going to flood the dry ground with water. I'm going to pour out my spirit, my living water on you because I've delivered you out of of Egypt. Now you're going to live in the promised land. You're going to go through some wilderness, but I'm going to provide water. When you get to the promised land, I'm going to feed you. I'm always going to be with you because my spirit will guide you. Wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls. Why? Because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. All of it is so that God gets glory. Whatever we're going through, whatever we're delivered from, it's so that the glory goes back to the Lord. There is a great story in the Old Testament, two stories, about Moses and the rock. And some of you will be familiar with those passages. There's one passage in Exodus 17, if you want to read it later, verses 7, chapter 17, 1 to 7. It talks about the people complaining because they had no water. And so Moses goes to the Lord, like, what am I going to do? Two, two million plus people, no water. We're in an arid land. What, what are we going to do? And the Lord says, go to the rock with the elders. Take your rod and hit the rock. And water will come out of it. And so they do. They go, they hit the rock, and the water comes out, and it provides for the people. You see, God didn't say to Moses, oh, for goodness sake, these people, now, I've already delivered them from Egypt. What else do they want? No, he's a God of compassion. God knew they were thirsty. He knew they needed water. He was trying to show them that he was their provider. And so he's using Moses to say, show them the miracle. I will provide. Hit the rock. And out came the water. Now, many years later, they're still complaining. Oh, there's no water. We're only going to die. Send us back to Egypt. Moses is mad. He goes to the Lord, what am I going to do with these people? And the Lord says, Go and speak to the rock, and I'll bring water out of it. What Moses does, because he's so mad, he goes back, he gets his rod, and he hits it twice. You want water, you morons? That's literally, the Aramaic translation is, you morons. Like, I am so sick of you. If you want, you want me to give you water, I'll give you water. Oh, that was so wrong on so many levels. But do you know how many times I have to say to the Lord, please don't let me be Moses? 
oh, please don't let me get frustrated and angry with these people because I'm one of them. <laughs> I mean, why do I think that I've got the right? I'm supposed to be there being an ambassador. I'm supposed to be helping lead women to Jesus. You know why uh, Moses didn't get into the promised land at that time? Because he didn't represent God's heart. God cared for the people no matter how, many ang how angry they were. He put him there as a leader to lead them and reflect his heart and his compassion for the people. And getting angry with them was not God's way of dealing with it. Certainly not through Moses. Was God angry with them? Of course. But he's the one. He says, revenge is mine, not yours. I will deal with my people. I know how to convict my people. I know how to judge my people. You need to love them and show who I am as a God of love and provision. You see, what those two examples were showing us I believe, as, as what scholars would tell us and better Bible experts than me, the first time Moses hit the rock was representing Jesus had to be struck. Jesus, God hit the rock to show that Jesus had to be hit. He was hit on the cross. And out of his side flowed living water. He was the fountain of life. That's where the river started for us in this day of grace. But it was foretold back through the example of Moses. Now, the second time God said to Moses when they were hungry, speak to the rock. Moses didn't do that. He went back and hit the rock twice. But you see, on the cross, Jesus cried, it is finished. It's finished. The work's done. God doesn't need to keep striking Jesus to get water from him because Jesus has already died. He's taken the punishment for you and for me. Every sin, every wickedness, our nature, our filth, it's been paid for, it's covered, and Jesus left and went back to heaven victorious and sits at the right hand of the Father. And now all those who are thirsty are invited to come to him and drink freely from the living water that flows from him, that flows from above. God isn't going to strike Jesus again. He's not putting them back on the cross every day, and neither should you. You receive his salvation. You receive his forgiveness of sin, and then you walk by faith in that freedom. And whatever you need, whatever your supply is that's running out, you go to him. You say, Lord, I need your life living through me. I need your love. You know what he's going to say to you when you say, I need more love. I can't love people the way I'm supposed to. Here's what he says. Romans 5, 5. The love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Poured out. Like he opens heaven up, pours his love into our hearts, to hearts that are willing, to hearts that are open, so that we can love others with his love. You know what? When the divine love of God gets a hold of us, it's overwhelming. And it makes me realize on those moments when I'm suddenly aware of loving people the way he loves them, I'm like, and, it, and it's like a small, minute piece of sand compared to the love of God's heart. But when you taste it, you go, oh my gosh, I'm so far away from that. In my flesh, there is no good thing, no capacity to love somebody else or forgive somebody else. Or bless somebody else when they curse and persecute me. Nothing in me. Corrie Ten Boom said it was impossible for her to forgive the man who had been responsible for her sister's death in the prison, prison camps in Auschwitz. She couldn't do it. And when he asked her forgiveness, she said no. And then the Holy Spirit convicted her. And this verse came to her mind. She said, pour out your Holy Spirit. Give me your love by your divine power, Lord. And at that moment, God's love just flowed through her divine, supernatural. And she had this amazing capacity to love this man who'd been responsible for so many deaths and hatred. He'd become a born-again believer. She had to love him. He was a brother in Christ. She had to accept him. You can only do that when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. When you go to him and ask him, Lord, give me your Holy Spirit. Paul, how many times did Paul say, take this thorn away from me? The Bible says at least three times. Three times he asked. Whatever trial, whatever it was, whether it was physical, spiritual, emotional, he kept asking, take it away. The, an the Lord's answer, my grace is sufficient for you because my strength is made perfect in weakness. 
If you want to experience the Holy Spirit, the best place you can be is weak, hopeless, helpless. <laughs> Maybe not hopeless, but sometimes we feel hopeless and helpless because that is when God shows up. It's not when I'm being all clever and thinking I've got it all together and this agenda is just going to work out the way I want. And Angie will tell you how many disasters and fights we have with printers and formatting and technical details and, and, and Doreen with the worship and t people falling out and then this going wrong and that going wrong. You all know what I'm talking about. Technology is like the bane of our lives. It's wonderful and terrible all at the same time. It's like the Christian walk, actually. <laughs> it's full of blessing and wonderful, and it's also quite terrible many times and very painful until we get to heaven. But he says, my grace is sufficient. And when is his grace shown the most? When you're in trouble, when you're hurting, when you're a Charles Spurgeon and your heart is so broken. And this is what Spurgeon says, I am the subject of depressions of spirit, so fearful that I hope none of you ever have to go to such extremes of wretchedness that I have to go to. Personally, I know there is nothing on earth that the human fr frame can suffer that compares with despondency and prostration of the mind. This man was tormented, and yet out of him came the most beautiful living water, which all of us get blessed by today and millions of Christians in the last hundred years. But it cost him. There is a cost when you have to lay down your life to experience the power and the love and the peace and the grace and the provision and the protection of the Holy Spirit. I want to um, take a minute to show us, uh, to, to watch a video here. But I'll just give you this statement that I heard from, again, it was from Pastor Greg Laurie, who, if you saw the Jesus Revolution, he was the young man that was featured in that. It was about him and Pastor Chuck Smith. He was talking about Pastor Chuck Smith when Pastor Chuck Smith died, and he made this statement. He said, one of the things that the pastor said to him, Greg Laurie's son died in a car crash. And Pastor Smith said to him, in the billows of affliction, don't give up what you know for what you don't know. In the billows of affliction, don't give up what you know for what you don't know. There's a lot we don't know when we're going through a dark time. There's a lot we don't know about the outcomes when we're going through a dark time. So what do I cling to? There is a river that flows through the heart of God and it's full of living water. It's full of God's love. He promises to be with me. He will never leave me nor forsake me. He is my refuge and my strength, a very present help in trouble. That's what I know. That's what I know here. But when I'm going through the billows and the trials, it starts to move from here to say, do I actually believe it here? Can I get a connection to get into my heart? And I stop just quoting a Sunday school verse and I actually start to live it and believe it and say, God, I'm choosing to trust and believe you. I want to show a video, um, Dennis, if we could get that uh, walking on water video ready for us and I'll just set it up for us a bit. If you've seen the Chosen series, this is from the Chosen season three uh, and the last episode eight, it was a clip which had me in tears on the floor because I was going through some things which I was really struggling with and I felt like God was, this was just recently in the last few months, like God was asking me to go somewhere, do something that I was just terrified, did not want to do it. I just, I do not have the strength to do this, Lord. Please send somebody else. <clears throat> and then I started watching this clip and I was on my floor at home weeping <laughs> and just like, Lord, I'm sorry, help me. And you'll see why when you see it. But the background to this, and they have some poetic license in it. Uh, it's based on some of the scripture, but they've kind of done an imagination story around it. And the story is that Peter and his wife um, had had a baby. Uh, the baby wasn't born. She was pregnant. And then she lost the baby. And Peter is building up with anger. 
And he's following Jesus around and he's watching the feeding of the 5,000 and he's, he's watching Jesus heal other people. And in him is building up this resentment. And the resentment is, why are you taking care of people that are not your people and your people are suffering? You had the power to save my baby. Why didn't you? That's what's going on in his heart. That's where his anger is. And so he's distanced himself. He's with, he's following Jesus around, but his heart's kind of departed. So that's the background. And then you're going to see his wife going through her situation, how she comes to the temple, uh, to the, the rabbis to help her walk through her healing while he's out with Jesus. So that's the background. I don't know how good the quality is, what kind of copy this is, but I hope you'll get the gist of it. Thanks, Dennis.
Dogs! No! Simon! Don't be foolish, Simon! Simon! Wait! Simon! No! Simon! Simon, Simon, where are you going? Simon, 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 it hasn't been my problem. I gave up everything to follow you. But you're healing total strangers! Blessed are you, my Lord, our God, King of the universe, who gives and takes away. Why do you think I allowed trials? I don't know! They prove the genuineness of your faith. They strengthen you. This is strengthening you. And Eden. Keep your eyes on me. Who comforts us in our grief and binds up the wounds of the brokenhearted. Eyes on me. I promise. Here. I'm always here. I let people go hungry, but I feed them. Please, please don't let me go.
don't let me go. <laughs> the purpose of the trial, I believe, and the lesson in that clip is that we become completely dependent, desperate and dependent on the Lord. There's so much that we could talk about just on that clip. I think it portrays the heart of many of us where we question, Lord, why didn't you show up for me? You show up for others. Where were you when I lost my son? Where were you when I lost my husband? Where were you when my business went down? Where were you when I got cancer and the others got healed and I didn't? Where were you in the trial? And Jesus says to Peter, I have many things planned for you, some of them hard. Keep your eyes on me. Because the trials are to test the genuineness of our faith. And it's interesting that that was what Peter wrote in his letters. He talks about faith to the suffering church. That this is a time when you will experience being kept by the power of God through your faith. You will be kept by the power, not your power, not my power, by his power. And he says it's to, tra it's to test how genuine is our faith in the Lord Jesus? Do we trust him? Do we trust that God can deliver us and that if he doesn't choose to deliver us out of a hard time, it's because he has a plan and he wants me to, to see him in the midst of it. And Peter goes on to write about how wonderful it is that you love him even though you've never seen him. I think there's a special blessing in God's heart to each and every one of us who love Jesus, his son, even though we've never seen him. He said that to Thomas, didn't he? Blessed are those who believe but have not seen. And Peter writes the same thing. And I think the place that for me that I have seen in the greatest times is in my trials. So we thank God for the trials. And that's what Paul was saying uh, when he said that my grace is sufficient, my strength is made perfect in your weakness, Paul. Paul goes on to say, therefore, I boast in my trials. I boast in my infirmities. Because when I'm weak, his power rests on me. Can we boast in our trials? Or are we too busy complaining about them? And being entitled to a perfect Christian life or a perfect American life, or a perfect Western life, or human life. <laughs> we're entitled to all sorts. Actually, we're not, because sin came in through our choice. Jesus has made a way to escape from that sin, but he's going to start the world all over again, because this world is not going to get any better. So he's preparing us to bring others into a new earth, a new heaven. And during this time, he wants us to trust him. And sometimes that water is pretty deep. But in the water, I pray that we will see him in a way we've never seen him before.